Please join me in Jeremiah chapter 31, all the way back to verse 31, because I think this passage is exceptionally important to us as New Testament believers. It is quoted at length in the book of Hebrews chapter number 8, and that book, of course, is intended to show the superiority of the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ over the old covenant, which was inaugurated in the blood of bulls and goats. Jeremiah is writing these prophecies down in relationship to the recent fall of Jerusalem and the temple and the kingdom of Judah to the hands of the Babylonians and the exile of so many of the survivors into uh, Babylonia. And amidst all of the talk of judgment, there's always bits and pieces of hope given about the future. And that's exactly what we see here at Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares he who is, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, the house of Israel is the northern kingdom that went into exile to Assyria in 730, uh, uh, 734, uh, 732, somewhere in that neighborhood, B.C. And then the house of Judah is the southern kingdom, which just went into exile 587 B.C. So I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So that's the time of Moses. My covenant that they broke, because even though God brought them out of Egypt with a very high hand and great miraculous signs and wonders, when they were faced with their covenant, uh, they kept breaking it repeatedly. Uh, Though I was their husband, declares he who is, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares he who is. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, That's in contrast to the ten words that represented the whole Old Covenant, uh, written on tablets of stone by the finger of God. Moses ends up breaking the first tablet because the people had already broken it. Many of those ten words were broken uh, in the golden calf incident. Uh, and uh, that's not the way this new covenant's going to be. It's going to be written on people's hearts, not on stone. And uh, this law is going to be the law of genuine love. The morality of God is summed up in our need to love him with 100% of our being and for us to love one another, to love other people as God would love them, as we love ourselves. That's the royal law, as the book of James puts it. So that's the new covenant law that's on our hearts. And because of that, God says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So that will be a true relationship, not a forced one like the old covenant was, a voluntary one. Verse number 34, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, no, he who is. That's an imperative. You better get yourself right with God, um, for they shall all know me. See, when you look at the new covenant, the only people that belong to the new covenant are those with a genuine heart relationship with God. So we don't need to teach each other that's already in the covenant, hey, get into the covenant, because we're already there. From the least of them to the greatest, declares he who is, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And that's such a great and precious promise, isn't it? That in the new covenant, we have full forgiveness of sin. Old covenant, there was only the potential because the old covenant was anchored in the new. The blooded bulls and goats couldn't remove sin except by the faith that was attached to that ceremony in a future perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. 
Let's continue in verse 35. Uh, This is where we closed up yesterday. Thus says he who is, who gives the sun for light by day, the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. So we're talking about creative order. Uh, God gave light sources to function as timepieces. And those timepieces have been ticking off quite precisely ever since creation started. And the seas, they have their limitations. God brought the dry land into existence at creation, and he brought the uh, ocean basin into creation uh, at the same time, and they are distinct from one another. And even when the flood happened, the worldwide flood, and momentarily uh, the ocean covered the land, God put it back in place and said, no more will it cross the termination point. There will always be a land, there will always be a sea, until creation is finished and the new creation is put in place. So what's God's point? He who is of the hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares he who is, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. So God is basically saying, yes, you might see great disaster happening at this moment with northern Israel already gone into Assyrian captivity, southern Israel going into Babylonian captivity. The land of promise is being emptied of its people. The cities are being destroyed. The capital city is nothing but ruins, and the temple is gone. You may think this is the end, but it's not. God promises there will always be an Israeli people. Always. Doesn't matter what Haman tried to do during the time of Esther, God would not have allowed him to annihilate the Jews. Doesn't matter what Hitler did in our more modern time, God would never have allowed him to annihilate the Jews. Because God's promise is clear here in black and white and empowered by his name, they will never cease to exist as a people group. Verse 37, Thus says he who is, If the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they've done, declares he who is. So God says, It's not going to happen. It is a fixed fact that there will always be an Israeli people group And, as Paul makes pretty clear in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, God will always be interested in what's going on with that people group. Verse number 38. Behold, the days are coming, declares he who is, when the city, that's the city of Jerusalem, freshly destroyed as Jeremiah is writing this down. When the city shall be rebuilt for he who is from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. Doesn't really matter for our purposes to know exactly where those places are. Uh, Just know that it's going to be rebuilt. And the measuring line shall go out farther, straight to the hill Gareb, and shall be uh, then turned to Goa. The whole valley of the dead bodies and the ashes which that's probably a mention of the mass grave that happened with all the dead bodies collected after the destruction of the city. And all the fields as far as the brook Kidron, uh, the Kidron brook runs along the eastern side of the Temple Mount and Old Jerusalem, the city of David, south of the Temple Mount. So all of that area to the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be sacred to he who is. It shall not be uprooted or overthrown any more forever. Now, the moment we hear those words, we know that this pushes past the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem in the time of uh, Zerubbabel and uh, high priest Joshua and Ezra and Nehemiah, because that city was also destroyed in A.D. 70, and the temple 
uh, was also destroyed uh, in AD 70. So that couldn't be the one that's being referenced here. This has to be a reference to a city that will endure into the millennial and eternal time periods. And so the, the Jerusalem, we would say, of the kingdom of eternity. So God has made a promise that it will be back and will stay. And I very much look forward to uh, being able to travel uh, in and around that future Jerusalem in the new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. It is at this point that we are going to go to the book of Lamentations, which was written, we understand, by Jeremiah the prophet. And he had the perfect opportunity to see the city of Jerusalem as it was being besieged, as it was being broken into, as it was being demolished, dismantled, and destroyed. And then he would have seen everything happening with the exile procedures. Remember, he spent time at Ramah, a few miles north of the city of Jerusalem, where the the encampment was located to process all the survivors of uh, the siege of Jerusalem. Uh, so he's seen everything related to the sorrows of the end of the Judean kingdom. And so he has free reign to travel now. So he can actually go down and, and sit and v- over any hill that looks down over the ruins of the city. He can also walk around in the ruins of the city. And so he writes this lamentation, this sad, sad song, as a memorial to the city that is no more until God causes it to be rebuilt. Lamentations chapter 1 verse 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become, she who was great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. Lots of little similes here. She used to be full, now she's empty. She was like a great woman, proud and uh, uh, well-known in the nations, but now she's a widow a pitiable figure. She was once a princess of all the provinces, but now she's been turned into a slave. Verse 2, she weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. So no one is able to come to her rescue. In fact, some of the people groups, some of the nations that she thought she could depend upon to rescue her from the Babylonians actually turned on her. Verse 3, Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. So Judah was not being righteous, not being fair, and so that's why Judah has been exiled from the promised land. She dwells now among the nations, but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. So the survivors don't live in Judah anymore. They're either on their way or have already arrived in their new uh, living places in Babylonia. But they don't feel at rest. They don't feel at peace there because they're their past is still catching up with them. There's still bad things happening. Verse 4, The roads to Zion mourn, for none come to the festival. Uh, The city was destroyed in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the fifth month of the Jewish year. Uh, That would be past the main festivals of Passover and Pentecost. Uh, The city was actually under siege during those. Uh, But the next big festival happens in the seventh month. Uh, But people are not coming in droves for that because the people are gone. 
there's only a small representative sample of Jews allowed to stay in the land. So the roads for pilgrims are empty. All her gates are desolate. Her gates have actually been pulled down and burned. Her priests groan. Those that have survived are groaning about the loss of the temple. Her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. So there's sadness all around, not happiness. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper because he who is has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away captives before the foe. Uh, There's going to be reminders throughout this book that this didn't happen randomly. This is not some sort of plot by evil people against a righteous people. This is the judgment of God long ago announced against a sinful people of Israel. That's why they're going into exile. From the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Now, we all have seen deer running away uh, because we disturbed them. But these deer are running away because there's nothing to eat. They keep running and running and running and running because they'd have nothing to sustain them. And that's the exile experience. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and wanderings all the precious things that were hers from days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was none to help her, her foes gloated over her. They mocked at her downfall. So everything's changed. Uh, They can reminisce all they want about the good old days, but this is the bad present. They are being mocked uh, for what's happened to them. Jerusalem sinned grievously, therefore she became filthy. Make no bones about it. There is a direct one-to-one correlation between the sin of Israel and the judgment of God against Israel. All who honored her despise her, for they've seen her nakedness. She herself groans and takes or turns her face away. So she is like a, a woman that has been publicly caught in cheating on her husband, and now she's bearing all of the community's shame for that. Uh, her uncleanness was in her skirts. She took no thought of her future, and therefore her, ter- her fall is terrible. She has no comforter. So God is divorcing her in a public ceremony. Oh, he who is, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. Every once in a while we have this, this exclamation that pops up uh, of the, the nation of Judah crying out because of the horrible things that have happened to her. Verse 10, the enemy has stretched out his hands over all her precious things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation. Uh, The survivors have had to endure watching non-Israelis enter the shrine building and dismantle its sacred components and carry them away to be used for whatever it is that Babylon wants to use them for. Uh, Those are places that the Mosaic Law said that non-Israelis were not supposed to go. Even common ordinary Israelis were not supposed to cross over certain points to enter into the shrine building. And so part of the punishment is they have to watch as the temple is violated. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. We know that this is a normal thing that happens in sieges. By the time you get to the end of the siege, people are starving. And whatever things used to be of value, they're willing to trade away cheaply in order to get 
even the smallest morsel of food for themselves and their family members. So they're seeing that, and Jeremiah is putting that in his lamentation. And then we have this, Look, O he who is, and see, for I am despised. So the nation cries out again to God, Are you watching? Are you seeing this? Verse 12, Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there's any sorrow like my sorrow, which has been brought upon me, which he who is inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. So has anyone ever had this sort of desolation inflicted on them before? From on high, he sent fire into my bones. He made it descend. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint all the day long. And all this is true. All this is an acknowledgement that this is from the Lord. This is from God. It's his punishment for their sin. Verse 14, my transgressions were bound into a yoke. By my hand, they were fastened together. They were set upon my neck. He caused my strength to fail. He who is, or the Lord, gave me into the hands of those whom I could not or cannot withstand. A, a yoke is for an animal. And in this case, uh, the sins of Judah have been turned into a yoke and placed on Judah's neck, which should remind you, Jeremiah went for a while wearing a yoke and saying, you either need to take on the yoke of Babylon by your own free will, or God will force you to wear the yoke of Babylon. So in this case, it's the yoke of sin that God has placed upon Judah. And um, that involved being handed over to the Babylonians. Verse 15, uh, the Lord, he who is rejected all my mighty men in my midst, all the military, he summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men, which again, military is often made up of the youngest men, uh, adult men in a, in a uh, group. Uh, the Lord has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. Uh, Book of Revelation also pictures uh, God treading the vinepress of his wrath. Uh, it's actually where we get the term grapes of wrath uh, from the book of Revelation. So here, uh, Jeremiah is, is uh, picturing God stomping out the grapes of his wrath against the virgin daughter of Judah. Uh, for these things I weep. My eyes flow with tears, for a comforter is far from me, one to revive my spirit. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. So a lot of crying. Uh, it would have been better if it had come earlier and been genuine repentance, but at least there is some sorrow and acknowledgement that this is coming because of sin. Verse 17, Zion stretches out her hands, but there is none to comfort her. He who is has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors should be his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. He who is is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. Very important, that sort of confession. Uh, we cannot get to the fix until we're ready to acknowledge the the way things got messed up, that we are the ones that sinned, and that's why we need the Savior. And so here is Jerusalem, here is Judah being portrayed as confessing that God is in the right and that they were in the wrong. But here, all you peoples, see my suffering, my young women, my young men have gone into captivity. So bear testimony, bear witness to my testimony that I brought this on myself, the exile. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. So Jerusalem had tried to reach out to other nations and allies around them, uh, but it was too late. And those places played them for the fool. And so priests and elders, which used to be the leaders 
uh, in the spiritual and political matters. Uh, they are starving to death during the siege and in the, uh, in the aftermath of the city being taken. Oh, he who is, for I am, look, oh, he who is, for I'm in distress. My stomach churns, my heart is wrung within me because I've been very rebellious. So an acknowledgement again, I have brought this on myself. I've made my life a living hell because of my rebelliousness. In the street, the sword bereaves. In the house, it's like death. So there's death and destruction everywhere. They heard my groaning, yet there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They're glad that you've done it. And that was true for many of the nations around Israel. They were glad that Judah was in trouble, in part because they'd been trouble to other countries around them. Uh, you have brought the day you announced, now let them be as I am. Interesting. Uh, there is this, this petition uh, phrased out by Jeremiah himself uh, that everything has happened exactly as prophesied to Judah. Now, let all of the prophecies of judgment against the surrounding nations come true, because there's been plenty of those as well. Let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you've dealt with me because of all my transgressions. For my groans are many and my heart is faint. So Jeremiah pictures Jerusalem, Judah, asking God to pay back the sinful nations around because they deserve it too. They need to give an account to God for their sinful nature. And that's definitely going to happen. And some of our other prophecy books, some of the minor prophets, the not-so-famous prophets, are going to relate to God's judgment on these other surrounding nations. Well, we'll mark our place for chapter 2.